Another edition of Dino's Deep Dank Dark Web. I'm here with David Layton from Tucson.com and the Arizona Daily Star newspaper. How are you today, Dave? You know, I'm great, Dino, and thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Now, if you've never seen David before on TV, he does a lot of, you know, media stuff, but he's most famous for his columns about the origins of Tucson streets. They're called Street Smart Columns, and uh, he knows everything about the dirty tea, and it's pretty dirty. <laughs> that's pretty That's pretty true. It's a, it's a, it's a dirty tea town. <laughs> it is. It is. So uh, let's start off with commonly mispronounced street names. What are the most? I, could, I know a couple right off the top of my head. You know, I, I think the most mispronounced street name, and it's quite famous, but uh, Ina Road. Right. Ina Road, uh, named for, it's on the north side, named for Ina Giddings. Uh-huh. Uh, almost everybody, it seems, nowadays is calling Ina Road. Right. So Ina Road, probably the most commonly mispronounced street name in Tucson, uh, but it is actually Ina Road, named for a homesteader named Ina Giddings, who also was a uh, PE instructor at the University of Arizona. Okay, maybe we should change I-10 to Ina-10. Just, you know, you know, I, I think we should start calling it Ina 10, you know, to make up for the fact that we're mispronouncing her street name and calling right. it Ina. We should call I 10 Ina 10. I think that's a great idea. Do you know now uh, Houghton Road? I mean, I'm just looking at how it's spelled. I mean, you know, like just sounded out people. Hooten, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the the uh, the road is actually pronounced Houghton. Oh, Houghton. It's actually named for a... Uh, oh! Yeah. <laughs> it's actually named for a William and Florence Houghton, mm. uh, who actually did also homestead out in that area as well. Okay. Um, so uh, interesting factoid about uh, Florence Houghton is that she is the great-granddaughter of the founder of Smith & Wesson. Oh, okay. So she's the granddaughter of Daniel Wesson of Smith & Wesson, uh, one of the major gun manufacturers in the world. So if you mispronounce the name, they will shoot you. You know, I think it's a possibility she might come back from her grave (laughs) and go ahead and take you out. Yes. But that's definitely a a commonly mispronounced one, though. It is definitely uh, Houghton. All right. Ajo. Not Ajo? Uh, not Ajo. Are we sure it's not Ajo? I'm pretty sure it's Ajo, right? Because the J in Spanish, right? You know, uh, you know that's that's an interesting one. And uh, you know, someone's from out of town mm-hmm. if they're like, "Oh, I'm on Ajo <laughs> Road." <laughs> Where the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the I-19 and Ajo Road. <laughs> Ajo Road. <laughs> <laughs> Ajo Road. Yeah, that one's. Um, if you're from out of town, people commonly mispronounce that mm-hmm. one. So uh, we in Tucson do pronounce it Ajo. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and of course it does derive its name from the town that the, uh, road went to, or probably still goes to actually kind of right. indirectly eventually. now. Yeah. Eventually <laughs> you do get there after going to a few other places there. Uh, one of the interesting facts about, um, Ajo Road is that it was originally called Robles Road. Mm. The road originally, uh, was created by a man named Burnaby Robles, um, and it went to his ranch called the Robles Ranch. Um, now the town that is was his ranch is called Three Points. Oh. So, the Three uh, Points Ranch. Well, I don't know <laughs> if it's called Three Points Ranch, but it is called Three Points. So the town of Three Points was originally the Robles Ranch. Um, another alternative name, of course, is Robles Junction. Uh, but it all came back to the uh, 1880s. A man named Burnaby Robles and his brother uh, started a ranch out there. And eventually to get a quicker way out to the ranch, he built the road. Okay. Um, you still have the Robles Pass. Uh, that name's still in existence, uh, but Robles Road has now been changed to Ajo for okay. the town that it went to, or still goes to, I guess. Ajo. Indirectly. Ajo. But Ajo actually sounds kind of <laughs> cool. You know, I kind of like Ajo. And then Tanca Verde. I guess if you're not familiar with uh, Spanish and you're coming here from another place, that's going to throw you for a loop pretty quick. Yeah, you know, I... I it seems like a lot of people do get that one. Right. Uh, Tanque Verde or Tanque Verde mm. um, translates to uh, green tank <laughs> or older Spanish. Some people might say uh, green watering hole. Ah, I gotcha. Um, I think, you know, some historians say that the origin of the name of that road, and I have not done a lot of research, but um, some of them say that there was a natural spring um, out in that area. And near the what we call the Tanque Verde Mountains area, 
and it was a what kind of a large watering hole for cattle and stuff like that that roamed in that area and it supposedly had a green algae growing on it or uh-huh. something like that and that's where some historians have told me that the name comes from uh, so it's not from- a fountain of youth no, definitely no fountain of youth. Sadly, <laughs> sadly, no. You can keep driving and driving and driving, and you will not find the fountain of youth. Just like Ponce de Leon did not find the fountain of youth in Florida. Sadly, mm. in the fifteen hundreds. Oh. Wah, wah. <laughs> and I'm sorry to tell people that, but you know, that is. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've kind of anglicized it to Tanca Verde. Uh, correctly, it would be Tanca Verde. So mm. another kind of somewhat mispronounced, but not hugely mispronounced, you could say. Okay. But I think Tucson might have one of the most crazily named streets in, I don't know, maybe even in the world, Super Chicken Drive. Where the hell is Super Chicken Drive? I want to go. You know, Super Chicken Drive is this tiny little street. Uh, it's off of, of all places, Tanca Verde Road. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're heading, uh, what would it be, east on Tanca Verde Road going to Mount Lemon, as you go over the bridge... Right. You kind of look down on the bridge going north, and there's an apartment complex called Estancia Apartments. Okay. I believe they're still called that. And there's a small little tiny street that kind of runs kind of east and west in front of those apartments, and it's called Super Chicken Drive. <laughs> Super Chicken Drive. It actually made a national website of top 10 best street names in the country. Wow. I think that, yeah, I mean... I would love, I mean, I'm sure they probably can't have a sign like on the corner. I'm sure it gets stolen all the time. Yeah. You know, when I did the story uh, a few years back there, I interviewed someone that had lived there at the apartment complex. And she said that every time they put the sign up, it would get stolen within a month. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty, it's pretty funny. I mean, they, and at this point, they no longer put. Uh, put the sign up. You can still find it on Google Maps. Okay. It's still there. Like I said, it's a tiny, like one block, one and a half block or something like that. But it, its history is pretty fascinating. Okay. As its name. Um, so back around 1980, uh, there was a Phoenix developer who was a hot air balloonist. He did that for fun. His name was John Shoecraft. And so around 1980, um, he decides he wants to fly a balloon into the Guinness Book of World's Record by flying a helium balloon across the United States. Mm-hmm. And so he asked his co-pilot's wife, uh, Sheila Rips was her name. He said, you know, you're somewhat of an artist. Um, can you draw me a the, the mythological phoenix bird? Got it. So she drew it, and after she was done, she showed it to him, and he was like, that's not a phoenix. <laughs> so that's a super chicken. <laughs> Uh, but he, he still loved it. He's like, this is a great character. Right. You know, this is a great drawing. I want to use it. So in 1980, um, him and his co-pilot flew the first super chicken balloon across the United States. Uh, they ended up having to bail out. Of course. And super chicken couldn't uh, make it. Super chicken could not make it across the United States. Ended up bailing out. And so they had to start all over. Ah, so they had to take their super chicken balloon back to California, uh, which is where they started off again. And the super chicken two uh, <laughs> took off again from Southern California and flew across the United States and sadly did not make it again. Oh, super chicken. Super yeah, dud. Super dud. I mean, this, this thing was a super dud is what it was. So he regroups. He's very determined. You know, he says later on, super chickens and all of us, you know, we're all chickens inside, but we've we're got all to, super chickens deep down. Right. We've got to overcome our fears. Mm-hmm. And so finally, the third trip, the super chicken three, it was called super chicken three balloon gets in there, decides rather than flying from Southern California to uh, the northeast of the United States, he's going to fly directly south across the southern United States. So they actually take the southern route, and they actually succeed. They land off a small island off the coast of, uh, I think it was Georgia, if I remember correctly. And so he flew himself into the Guinness Book of World Records. Oh, in wow. 19, I think it was 1981. I was saying next year. You know, you got to give this guy. He, Third he, time's he a charm, had, baby. He had heart. I, yeah. mean, <laughs> he had, I mean, on the first time, I think it was the first time, he actually ended up jumping out of the balloon. He tried to make an emergency landing, <laughs> jumped out of the balloon. The balloon went flying up again, 
and his co-pilot, uh, before they landed, uh, had to jump out with a parachute. And the first time he'd ever <laughs> used a parachute before. So you got to give these guys credit. I mean, they had a lot of heart. They didn't give know. up. They didn't give up. Yeah. And so um, I don't know if they're still in the Guinness Book of World Records in 1981, but... Um, so Super Chicken Drive, not where they have an El Polo Loco. No. no, and it's not named after the character, the cartoon character from the, I think it's 1970s. Okay, yeah. There was a, Super there, yes, there was actually a Super Chicken cartoon character <laughs> um, that was a spinoff from another cartoon, and that's where most people thought that actually came from. But it is kind of a, people tend to forget about the street just because the signs are no longer there. Right. It's just one block long, and... The streets or signs are no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things where you can still find it on Google Maps. Um, there's also a street called um, Gondola. So John Shoecraft, after this was done, I think it was in the early 90s, um, he was working in Tucson mm -hmm. building these apartment complex. This apartment complex, I think it's still called Estancia. And the city said, hey, you need to come up with a street name. So he said, I'll call it Super Chicken. Mm -hmm. So that's how Super Chicken came around. And then there's also a another street, small street in the area called Gondola. Mm -hmm. Now, if anyone knows anything about balloons, they know that the gondola is the bottom The part. gondola. The gondola, yeah, yeah. Gondola or gondola, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Ajo, ajo. Uh, yeah, Whatever. people, people <laughs> pronounce it different. <laughs> I've heard it pronounced yeah. different ways. So, um, But that's the bottom part of the balloon mm -hmm. um, that they sat in when they flew across. Or jumped out of. <laughs> or jumped out, and depending on what yeah, they were actually doing there, you know, so. All right. Well, uh, Cole Broad, that's one that sometimes is mispronounced because I think was, there was a, a, a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, Kevin Cobb. Kevin Cobb, yeah. yeah. I think Kevin Cobb actually played for Arizona for a little while. Uh, I he, believe. I, he could, might have, I yeah. could be wrong. I yeah. think he filled in for a little while. And just messed up. Now, we're not talking about Nick Foles. Everybody loves Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not talking about Nick Foles. We're talking about Kevin. He was a Philadelphia Eagle, too, and an Arizona Wildcat. Yeah, yeah, he definitely was. But, yeah, Kevin Cobb kind of confused people because his last name was K-O-L-B mm -hmm. as well. Um, so Cole wrote, and I have actually heard people call it Cobb occasionally. Mm -hmm. okay, people new to Tucson, I guess. Um, so Midwesterners. Cole, yeah, Midwesterners, New Yorkers, you know, right. Georgians. You know, Californians. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Kolb is actually, so Kolb has a little bit of interesting story behind it. So, originally, Kolb bore the name of Camino Miramonte, or Mountain View Road. Okay. So, Camino Miramonte. In 1957, the residents of El Encanto Estates, which is, of course, located just west of El Con Mall. Okay. Um thought that it might be too confusing because it was a Camino Miramonte. All those people live by Elcon, they're always uppity about something. Oh, about something. The if Walmart, it's not the Walmart, yeah. it's something else. <laughs> yeah. They decided that in 19, I think it was about 1956 or 57, they decided that it might be confusing um, and they didn't want to have two streets with the same name. Sure. Now, you got to take into account, back at this point, El Encanto Estates is in the city of Tucson, and what is now Kolb or Camino Miramonte was in Pima County. Right. So you could actually have the same street name really close to each other because one's in the border of the city of Tucson, one's county. Right. And that did happen a, a few times that I've come across in my research. But they decided that it could be confusing. They'd rather have it changed. Mm -hmm. They petitioned the county to change it. And several names were submitted. And they eventually chose Richard Kolb. Mm. Now, Richard Kolb had died the previous year. And he was actually the clerk of the Pima County Board of Supervisors. So they actually worked closely with him as the clerk. And so since he died the year before, they decided to name it his honor. Okay. Richard Kolb's is somewhat of an interesting history. Um, you know, he was, he was born in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, in the Midwest, you know, spent some time in California before coming out to uh, Arizona. He was a bean farmer, for an <laughs> unsuccessful bean farmer with his father and uh, his sister. Doesn't he know that you just get the cans? Yeah, I, and I don't know why they worked so hard back in those days. Yeah. You know, I don't know why they just don't go to a grocery store and buy this stuff, you know. Mm. It's like they felt the need to make life really hard in the early 1900s. Those bastards. You know, like, haven't you heard of a helicopter instead right. of, you know, taking a horse? I, I don't get it. But, right. You know, 
But um, so he actually he worked in the uh, courthouse, the famous courthouse in Tombstone for a few years. The town too tough to die. Yeah, exactly. That that town. Um, and then he spent some time in World War One, and then eventually he ended up in Tucson. Worked in definitely different um, departments of the county and mm-hmm. city and stuff like that. Assessor's office for many many years and stuff like that. Uh, before he became the clerk to the Pima County Board of Supervisors. Okay. So realistically, he was a veteran. He worked for the county, so it just made sense. Yeah, and I think a lot of it just came down to he had passed away the year before. It was fresh on the county's mind. They liked the guy. They needed a name, and they so they named it Kolb. All right. So last one we're going to talk about today. Orange Grove Road. Are you going to tell me there were actual orange groves here in the Dirty Tea? I'm going to tell you that there were a lot of orange groves okay. in the Dirty Tea. All right. So a little, little bit of history. The citrus tea. The citrus <laughs> tea. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the older pictures dating back to the 30s and 40s, I mean, there was a ton of trees in that area. Orange trees, lemon trees, date palms, you name it. It, it was incredible. Um, it, it's interesting to say that you know, the, the history dates back to a man named Maurice Reed. Now, people may know the, the name Reed because of Reed Park. Ah, gotcha. So Reed Park was named for his son, Gene C. Reed, who was the first Parks and Recreation uh, director for the city of Tucson. That was actually his son. Mm. So his son actually grew up. So I'll, I'll give you a little backstory. Maurice Reed comes to uh, Tucson 1923, 1924. Mm-hmm. Uh, like many people at that time, he had tuberculosis or TB, came for his health, um, decided he wanted to stay. He came from California, decided he didn't want to come back, um, so he brought his family out here. And so they lived here for a couple of years, and so he lived in town, and he used to take some trips out to, uh, horse trips out to the north side of town. There was nothing out there at the time in 23, right. 24. There's nothing out there. And he was kind of a... Amateur gardener, horticulturalist, something like that. He just did that as a hobby. He but liked he, weed. Got yeah, it. he liked mm-hmm. weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so he decided, you know, I want to grow citrus here in Tucson. And mm. most people were like, you can't do that. Right. It's just not a feasible thing. It's too damn hot. Too damn hot. Also, you know, during the winter, they tend to freeze up. So he just he starts heading out to different areas, and he accidentally comes across an area where he notices in the winter, this is in the winter time, that the plants didn't get very deep frostbite. So there's just an area north of town, um, a strip of land that for whatever reason, I mean, there's a scientific reason, which I don't fully understand, but right. there, there is a reason behind it where a certain area or strip of land uh, doesn't, the, the greenery doesn't get a frostbite there. or doesn't get extreme. So he buys a bunch of property at $3 an acre. Ooh. I mean that, you know, yeah. like that land's going for a lot more now in Orange Grove Road. Right. But he buys it for $3 an acre. And he starts planting uh, citrus trees. Orange starts with oranges, and they start becoming successful. Uh, lemon starts growing lemons and all that stuff. You got to remember. So Gene She Reed, who the park is named for, is growing up in this environment. Um, his old man is is getting up there in age, so he's he's the young son, and he's the one that does most of the planting and stuff like that. So he gets his green thumb from growing up with his father. Um, and I think by like the 1930s, I mean they're actually shipping all sorts of different citrus um, fruit all over the United States. Oh, wow. Um, and he calls it, it was originally called Reed's Ranch, ends up becoming Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, so that's the name of his ranch. And he, he runs it for many, many years. It's hugely successful. Um, like I said, sells it all over the United States and just lemon trees, date palms, papaya trees. I mean, just wow. they're, they're, he grew pretty much everything. Right. It was hugely successful in the middle of a desert, you know, <laughs> just a little strip of land and stuff like that. So, um, and so, you know, he somewhere along the line decides to sell some of his land. And I think it was during the depression when they needed some money and stuff like that. So he has to subdivide it, ends up naming a few streets after there, after towns in Los Angeles County. So he <laughs> spends a little time in California, and I think that's where he gets his names from. And then he decides the east-west alignment, he's going to name it uh, or he's going to get it named or anything like that. So it ends up becoming like Palos Verdes Road or something like that originally. This is mm. back in the late 20s, early 30s. And once again, uh, because of a street that sounds similar, 
in El Encanto Estates, mm, he and, and <laughs> he actually <laughs> he or the county, I'm not really sure who who actually submitted the plans to change things, but um, decides to have it changed and they change it to Orange Grove Road. Ah, and it's it is interesting because people that are new to town will ask me, there was no Orange Groves <laughs> were there. I said, yeah, there there actually there was really were. a huge area. I mean, there's still a few. Uh, I think there's a uh, a little street out there called Treasure Drive, and it was from a competitor who bought a little piece of land, and he called his um, citrus area uh, Desert Treasures or something like that. Got it. And eventually, he 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 buys out Gene, I uh, not Gene Reed, but Maurice Reed. He buys him out, buys his all stuff, takes over his old business, and Maurice Reed goes into real estate. His son becomes the first Parks and Recreation director. And later on, of course, now we have Gene C. Reed Park. All right. Well, uh, lots of interesting history here Definitely. in town. Uh, David Layton from Tucson.com and the Arizona Daily Star. Where can people get in touch with you if they have any questions? Um, you can get in touch with me at my email, uh, azjournalist21 at gmail.com. So it's azjournalist21 at gmail.com. Uh, also, my monthly, it's a once a month column, comes out uh, the first Monday of every month in the Arizona Daily Star newspaper and also on Tucson.com. All right. Are you on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff too? No, I, I kind of ah. keep a low profile, but all anyone right. can reach me through my email, azjournalist21 at gmail. Stay off social media, man. It's bad for you. You know, Facebook, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> kind of stay away from that now. So, Well, thanks so much, David, for coming into Dino's Deep Dank Dark Web. Thank you, Dino. Appreciate it, man.